Well, my earliest memories are actually from when I was in China. Until I was 10 years old, I spoke Sichuan dialect. We, were, we began the secret negotiations in uh, July of 1978 to establish diplomatic relations. And uh, they were so secret that the other members of the liaison office didn't know that we were engaging in the negotiations. Only Ambassador Woodcock and I uh, uh, knew what was going on. Uh, the Chinese had set three conditions, that we had to break relations with the Republic of China, we had to end our security treaty uh, with the Republic of China, and we had to remove our military forces mm -hmm. from, uh, from Taiwan. Carter had made the decision that we could meet those three requirements. Mm -hmm. But our interest was in ensuring that unification would take place peacefully. At the final stage of our negotiations, the third plenum of the 11th Central Committee was meeting and approving the reform and openness policies. So there were several things in Deng's mind that we weren't aware of. One was the confrontation with Vietnam, because you recall that two months after we established diplomatic relations, uh, China and Vietnam ended up in a military clash. Secondly, Deng Xiaoping clearly recognized that to have a success with the reform and openness policies, it would be desirable to have diplomatic relations with the United States. But we were not aware of these considerations. Uh, we were just dealing with the negotiations on a very narrow basis. But I think that when we couldn't reach agreement on the arms sales question, these other considerations, the confrontation with the Soviet Union and Vietnam, the reform and openness policies, uh, convinced him that it was wise to go ahead and establish diplomatic relations. But then we had the Clinton administration come in and they established human rights conditions for giving China most favored nation treatment. But we got over that hurdle, mm -hmm. uh, partly because our business community was opposed to establishing the linkage uh, with human rights. Right. And it was a, what I would call a technical mistake, mm -hmm. where we put one U.S. interest, which is in promoting human rights, against another U.S. interest, which is in promoting our economic and trade relations. Mm -hmm. And when you put your own interests in opposition to each other, you create a contradiction, mm. which the other party doesn't have to worry about. Right. <laughs> My attitude on the Li Donghui visit was, we could let Li Donghui visit, provided that we let Jiang Zemin come first. Mm. Because then we could show what an official visit was like, and that would contrast with the fact that we would not treat Li Donghui as an official visit. Instead, they wouldn't agree to having Jiang Zemin come, mm and they decided they wouldn't let Li Dong Hui come. Mm. Fine, but then they changed their view at the last minute because of a vote in Congress that said he should be permitted to come. Yeah. Uh, and it was that last minute aspect to the Li Dong Hui visit that made it impossible to manage. Right. Yeah. Uh, because we had told the Chinese at very high levels that we would not let him come and all of a sudden he was being permitted to come. Mm. Uh, so that was an awkward situation, but in the second term, they realized they moved away from the mistakes they had made in the first term, and we had an exchange of visits between Bill Clinton and, uh, and Jiang Zemin. I think that the engagement policy has absolutely been the right way to handle our relation with China. For example, I think that China and the United States should be working together to restructure the international order so that it better represents the interests of the rising countries like China and India and Brazil who are not adequately represented in the international institutions at the present time. Every country has to generate their own form of representative governance. But it's not for us to tell China how to do it. So I think this is an area where we can be cooperative actually. We shouldn't be trying to force a system on China, but at the same time we should recognize that there's no reason why China shouldn't be able to become stronger and wealthier. Mm -hmm. Every country aspires to wealth and power. Mm -hmm. uh, and some are more effective at achieving those goals than others, and China is one of those. But why shouldn't we be able to get along with a strong China? In my judgment, 
through engagement with China, we can get a better understanding of China's ambitions, China can understand our ambitions better, and we can find areas of commonality between them, which then become the basis for a good relationship between strong, prosperous countries.